everybody comes out of this region. Um, people along the coasts would go inland. Again, we're competing for resources. If I can capture you, I will sell you to the Europeans, and that keeps me and my family safe. I'm a business partner with the Europeans, and I've just got more land. And so there is a def definite African part of the slave trade, but everything is interrelated. The Americans are found, more food is brought over, more food, we compete for resources, so it's easy to just get rid of you. So, um, eventually, the area will be gleaned of all its people. Africa is robbed of its most precious resource, its own people, and the Europeans are like, well, there's only one guy left over here, all right, so Mark, we're going to leave you there, and we're going to move down the coast. And as they get down the coast, the rib cage, they come to the kingdom of the, the Congo, old Zaire, and Congo back then spelled with, with a K, and with the mighty Congo River, you can go deep into the heartland of Africa, and the Congo has thousands and thousands of small tributaries that European ships could get to. The Europeans come in, and they find willing chieftains to deal with. We'll give you some silk. We'll give you some pretty robes. We'll give you maybe a metal knife or a sword. But what you really want is alcohol and tobacco. Here you go, chiefy boy. You like that? Oh, yeah, smoke that up, peace pipe it, whatever. Hey, you want some more? <coughs> well, you want some more? All I need are some slaves. What can you do for me? Well, shoot. We got a guy down the river who I just cannot stand. And so the people of the Congo begin these tiny civil wars. It's kind of an every man for himself round robin. If I can capture the most slaves and sell them to the Europeans, my tribe, my village is safe. So the European intrusion is going to cause a lot of the slave trade. Europeans do it once again for consumables. Alcohol and tobacco, man, people do, you, they'll get crazy for it, and we'll give them a little more, and we'll give them a little more, and we'll give them a little more, and we're going to increase our demand every single time. And so eventually, there will be this young man, very brilliant guy named King Afonso I. And one of the things that will help the Europeans do all of this is they're going to send missionaries. Well, we'll go and Christianize these poor people. If we save their souls, well, it's okay, right? I mean, because we're helping them get to heaven. The missionaries come, and they teach the king's young son, here, Afonso, and he's fluent in Spanish, he's fluent in, in, in Portuguese, and he rises to, to power. And he writes a letter to the king of Portugal and says, Hey, what are you doing? We're both Christian kings. Why are you coming down here and stealing my people? What if I came up to Portugal and did the same thing to you? Christian king to Christian king, you need to stop. Portuguese king said, well, <sighs> you know what, I'm going to send some more missionaries down. All right, we're going we're gonna to investigate this. And the missionaries may have went with good intentions, but God, there is so much money to be made. They're like, ah, heck with it, keep going. And so Alfonso gets angry, and he sponsors a boycott of Portuguese goods. And he's such a good leader, and he's a young guy, and his people respect him. That they do. And the Portuguese are angry. So they go, well, shoot. The guy's not going to play ball with us. What's the easiest thing to do? I'll kill him. I'll just kill him. All right? It's not too hard. So they try to assassinate him. And the assassination attempt fails. Not only does it fail, it blows up in the face of the Portuguese, of the, of the, yeah, the Portuguese. People of Congo are so angry, they double down on their boycott, and King Afonso is eventually able to restrict um, Portugal to one port, Blackport, Port Noir, where they had their slave fort. 
Unfortunately, um, soon after King Afonso dies, um, a civil war will break out. Once again, instead of focusing on the external enemy, that kind of round-robin tournament of, you know, I'll keep myself safe breaks out. And it's called the Yaga Wars or the um, Jaga Wars. And it allows um, the Portuguese to reassert their control. And so the Congo in the 15-1600s is just destroyed by the Portuguese. The Congo just begins to recover, and then the Belgians come in in the 1800s and really deals a hard economic death blow. You guys may have heard of the pictures of the, um, the Belgians cutting off the hands and the feet of the young kids to get access to you know, rubber and materials. It's horrible. <coughs> Excuse me. All of a sudden, oh, it's killing me. 18 hours in this building. Mm. Probably going to have Ebola tomorrow. Uh, all right. All right. So, all right. so um, here is what is left of the Portuguese fort at Port, Point Pont Noir, where you would run down to the dock. They did destroy most of it. But this in the museum is a little cutting of um, what they had. It's hard to see, but it's all the... Um, you know, Congans with, you know, on a pole with their hands in chains being led down to the fort, down into the tunnel, onto the waiting um, slave ship. So, yay, Portugal. All right. Now, Portuguese are going to go down farther south, and there they can't find a way to get inland. And they've been really, 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 really going on their voyages of exploration, and they get down to the tip of Africa, and they see all those jumping sharks you see on like Shark Week. They're like, boy, we're going to call this the Cape of Good Hope. It's two reasons. Number one, you hope you make it around alive. <laughs> and if you make it around, you hope there's something over there that's going to make you rich. While Portugal was destroying and sailing down West Africa, over in the east, over in the Swahili area, Djibouti, Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya is a great heyday of economic profit. East Africa is connected to not only the Middle East, but also India and China through the Indian Ocean Trade Network, the Indian Ocean part of the Silk Road. And so Muslims had built small little port towns all the way up and down the East Coast, little fortress cities. Think of like Boston and New York and Philadelphia and, you know, uh, Wilmington, Norfolk, um, our Wilmington, you know, Savannah, Charleston, all the way down to St. Augustine. That is up and down East Africa, all these coastal ports. And the Portuguese are going to make it eventually around the Horn of Africa. And they look around and they see... All these cargo ships, Chinese junks, Arab dows, they see all this stuff being traded, gold and salt and slaves and silk and spices, and they're like, boy, we got to get us <laughs> some of that. <laughs> right. We're going to ask them if we can get in, and if they won't let us, well then shoot, we'll just kill, we'll just kill them. And due to their growing um, powerful technology, the Portuguese Navy, the Portuguese man of war was so big, you know, 30 cannons on one side. The Arabs, a lot of the, um, you know, Indians, Chinese won't deal with them. There's, there's a language barrier there. And so the Portuguese say, well, we'll just do what we do and we'll just blow it up. And the Indian Ocean trade route is dominated by Portugal. So early on, 14, 15, 16, we think of like Spain and we think of France and England. The heavyweight in Europe was Portugal. Right? Portugal, they were just straight thugs. All right, like here we are, we're going to dominate everything. And they go up and down the coast and very stupidly, and, and one of the things that, that allowed Islam to spread so far, so fast, Alexander the Great, you know, conquerors like that is they didn't destroy a lot of infrastructure, right? If we blow up the aqueducts and the roads and the bridges, well, we're going to have to fix them. And if we fix them, it takes time, it takes money. So we'll try and leave that stuff there. Portugal, whatever, blow it up. 
All right? Why? I don't know. Because it's there. And when the Indian Ocean traders don't work with them, they go up to those Wilmingtons and Norfolks and Bostons and Philadelphias and Charlestons, and they blow up um, the town. If you won't trade with me, then I'm just going to destroy you. So the Portuguese leave widespread economic destruction on the East Coast. Then they begin to stay there, and some of the Portuguese sailors aren't getting back on the boat. You know what? Being on a boat for six, eight months for a year with all those dudes, it's got that funky locker room smell to it. I'm just not getting back on there. I'm going to stay right here. When you guys come to trade, I'm going to have this stuff ready and waiting for you. And so they begin to set up their little own personal kingdoms or fiefdoms. And then they begin to marry into the native African culture, and their offspring are known as Prazeros, P-R-A-Z-E-R-O-S, like Prazero. And they're neither accepted by the African community nor the Portuguese community. So these Prazeros become kind of this lawless group of band. They're, they don't respect African authority. They don't care about the king of Portugal. And they become very dominant, very almost like little like you know drug lord kingpins um, taking over the economic trade. So bad will the economic disaster that they will cause, so greedy and extractive will they become, there is a massive famine that hits like parts of Ethiopia. As it hits part of Ethiopia, a group comes from the, uh, to the interior and they have just years and years of warfare, that it's almost safe to say the economic decline that Ethiopia and Somalia has right now starts back here in the late 1500s with the Portuguese intrusion onto East Africa. The area has just never been able to recover since then. But there's a brief bit of happiness. Down to the south, Due to the interior is the civilization of the great Zimbabwe, kind of down in the southern third. And I'm going to pass this book around if you want. And also, um, I was telling some of the earlier folks, if you look at this spot right here, well, just to the left of it, I was there for six weeks. And I'll tell you guys a little story. You guys mind my, my, my little story? Mark, you've uh, um, heard this story, so... Um, you might remember it. So I was there, and there are two, two stories that I, I love to tell about this part. Um, one was we, I lived in, in a Neolithic village. I'll try and find my, my slides here. I hold like 35 millimeter slides. And uh, that's how long ago it was. And we lived in, in a communal village. And so we ate um, uh, once a day and twice a day on Sunday. And the meal was called sods. It's like raw peanut butter on like this um, leaf. And on Sunday we had sadza, we had some rice, and this meat, um, you know, tasted like chicken. It was known as bicycle bird. It was like a demonic little chicken that when it ran it looked like it was peddling a, a bicycle. <laughs> and uh, it could also fly. And so if we caught one bicycle bird, everybody got like a nickel or a ten cent, you know, you know, portion. If we caught like 30 bicycle birds, everybody got their own bicycle bird. But Bill Malaga says, I'm going to be the Tarzan of bicycle. I'm going to be the greatest <laughs> bicycle bird hunter. I will exterminate the species from around Victoria Falls here. And oh my God. I lost 30 pounds. I'm not even going to lie. I should probably go back. <laughs> God, they were hard um, uh, to catch. So I would go down, like at night, kind of exhausted, and I would try and look at um, the building here, the Great Zimbabwe, and it was like an African version of the Athenian Acropolis. On the walls um, were like 32 feet high, and like 60 feet thick in places. So they're higher and wider than the Great Wall of China, but nowhere near as big. These silos held grain were 25 and 30 feet tall. Here's the aerial view of it. And they didn't use mortar. 
They were excellent stonemasons. You can see on the back of that rock, there is a little indentation cut in there where they kind of, um, you know, dovetailed it. It all fit together like jigsaw pieces. So I would sit there, and I'm trying to stack them, and I would get a stack like, the, you know, like 18 inches, 2 feet high, and it would fall down. Ah! You know, sorting all the pieces out, and ones that I thought, and the old guys would just shake their head, stupid, you know, American white guy, what the hell's he doing? And on my last day, the elder came up, and he shook my hand, kind of out his head, shook my hand, and he pressed into my palm that piece of rock. So my students know I have a bad habit of going to historical sites with boots that have a very thick tread on them. And like things get stuck in my boot tread, and I'm like, oh, well, shoot, I already left. I might as well bring it back to the classroom. <laughs> that one was officially given to me by the chief of the tribe. So I'm, I, think, I think I'm good here from uh, the, the, the UN. The other story I try and tell the students is that understanding different cultures, um, our fresh water well was about a half hour away. And I'm coming back one day, I've got like four bicycle birds, I'm feeling you know, pretty good about myself. And there's this old lady carrying like a five-gallon Lowe's Home Depot bucket of water. And she would walk like four or five steps, and she would set it down and shake out her hand, and she'd walk four or five more steps. And here comes, you know, Husky Boom, leg trying to long one. You know what, ma'am? Let me get that for you. And I grab the bucket, and I take like two steps, and whack! I'm like, ow! Oh, ah! She hit me with her walking stick right on the I'm like, what is your problem? <laughs> what I didn't know is in the small community, you are valued by your labor. Now, everybody worked, men, women, little kids. And by grabbing the bucket, I was, you know, thinking of being a gentleman. In her culture, I was insulting her by saying, well... You're useless. You can't work anymore. So she ripped me with her walk. Hey, you know what? I'll see you back at camp. I'm just going to take my little birds and just, you know, I'm going to stroll on. So anyway. Um, uh, so uh, she, she had a pretty good swing. So anyway. All right. So the Great Zimbabwe is in South Central Africa, and they were far enough inland that the Portuguese never got to them. And their civilization is almost a mere image of ancient Greece and also the Mayan city-states over in Mexico. In that they lived in a giant Acropolis-like structure with the biggest part of the structure high up on a hill, surrounded by a big defensive wall. There were grain silos there. There was a freshwater well dug. And there were um, temples to the important African gods and goddesses um, of their area. And the two rivers, the Zambezi, and my favorite is the Limpopo. I right, love to say Limpopo. <laughs> Lots of alluvial gold. You can look down and see gold in the water. Problem is you can't get to it. Number one, it's safe and protected as an aquifer. Number two... It's full of 20-foot long African crocodiles. So you may reach your hand in to get um, the gold. The problem is you're going to come back like Stumpy. Um, and so it was hard for anybody to get there. But Zimbabwe has a lot of gold. And what's interesting, we still don't know whether it was direct trade or indirect trade. We found Persian um, ceramics and Persian rugs, silk, and even Ming Dynasty porcelain that from somehow made it from China and Central Asia down into Africa. So there was some type of trade going on. The Portuguese never found out. The Portuguese, you know, couldn't find the blockade runners. But there was trade going on between Asia, the Middle East, and Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwean artifacts have been found in the other locations. We just don't know, was it over land? It would be much easier to go by water, definitely to China, but we don't know um, how. And so these city-states, um, there were a bunch of them, were exactly like Athens. The high-ranking priests and nobles lived high up on the hill. 
There was a middle class market in the middle, and then outside the main gates was the giant fertile farmland where people, they were herders. They raised cattle, they raised sheep, and they farmed. And the only terrible thing is, since nobody bothered them, the people of the Great Zimbabwe didn't write anything down. So we have all these artifacts, um, they're rich, um, you know, architecture, but no writing whatsoever. So when I left um, Zimbabwe, um, I, you know, grabbed a few things. Here is, um, a, 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 this guy was really cool. Um, he had a big spear and a lion mane on it, but it broke on the plane. I was really mad when I got back. I, I didn't do it, but anyway. Um, like this little, um, uh, uh, you know, potpourri little box here. And then this is the stone, um, um, polished and smooth, that is the same as the rock that built the Great Zimbabwe. It feel, feels almost um, like glass. So feel free to come up and uh, check these out. Just don't break one. My wife will kill me. I'll blame it on some. I'll blame it on Reed or Mark or somebody, but that'll be all right. Uh, I'll blame it on Jen. All right, that's what I'll do. Anyway. Yeah, there is that she likes you, so so we're good. So anyway, um, this great wonderful civilization reaches its high point right around the same time, 15, you know, 1600, and then either they made themselves small to stay out of sight, or they collapse because we've got two new players into the slave game. Number one are the Dutch. I think, aren't they like in windmills, windmills or smoking dope in Amsterdam or whatever it is that they're doing? Nobody even really knows. Um, and the Dutch are also a powerful, vibrant economic civilization. The Dutch trading ships take over from Portugal before Spain and England. Even the British were kind of really afraid of Dutch sea power for a, a long time. And in 652, the Dutch sailing down Africa decide, before we try and swoop our way around the Horn, let's take a little rest stop. This place is warm and sunny. Let's check this out. Let's call it South Africa, because we're in the south of, of, of Africa. And they do. And the Dutch set up the precursor of one of the great diabolical yet economically powerful things in the world, the British East India Company. Well, centuries before the, the BEIC was in existence, the Dutch found the East India Company. And what they wanted to do was get direct access to India and China and set up little relay stations along the way so their ships could safely travel and always have cargo either coming and going. And the um, idea was the first original investors in the Dutch East India Company, first guys that went in, if their ships made one successful run, they would have more money in the Netherlands than they could spend in their entire lives. So there are still people today that are rich from great, 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 great grandpa being in on the DEIC. Right, they're just like, um, like Princess Diana's family, all right, B E I C D E I C. They own 227 estates in, in Europe and in Africa. And she was a minor noble until Prince Charles married her. Like, well, I wouldn't mind being like a minor noble. I'll take that out for a spin and see how far they I'd probably do okay. But anyway, um, they begin to set up a little trading depot there. And they meet with the friendly inhabitants who are cattle farmers known as koi koi's. It's just fun to try and say koi 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 koi. Well, suddenly thereafter, the Dutch begin to come, you know, more frequently, and guys get off the ship and they're like, "Well, in the Netherlands, it's kind of gray, mm -hmm. kind of cold." Kind of looks like you're in Cleveland, Ohio, all the time. <laughs> Down here, whoo boy. Got a Carolina blue sky day. It's warm. Got this sea breeze. No, I just don't think. I don't think I'm getting back on the ship. I'm going to stay right here. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll work at the depot or, you know, go build a fence and go grab some cattle. So more and more and more Dutch began to permanently settle. 
They basically become known as um, Afrikaners. And at first they worked very well with the Khoi Khoi. Then they began to displace the Khoi Khoi. They kick them off their grazing lands, or they built barns and fences and settlements that was Khoi Khoi land. And the Khoi Khois begin to rebel. And there is a war between the Dutch and the native Africans. Now the Dutch are, are winning, but there is another country that's really, really, really good at instigating or watching people fight. And they'll just sit there and wait and be like, ooh, God, that would hurt. Oh, man, that means duck. <laughs> and when both sides are you know, panting and bleeding and bloody, they swoop in and take over. Nobody does that better than the British. And as the Dutch are tired from fighting the Khoi Khois, the British take over. They will um, kick out the Dutch eventually, and they will lay claim to and settle in South Africa. Um, they take cattle, they take gold, and they begin um, to take slaves. And eventually the British settlers will found the diabolical government of apartheid, which ends in 1990-1992. But while they were there, the Dutch and the British picked up on a lot of really neat African fables and folktales, very similar to um, a lot of um, Aesop's fables, or, you know, beware of low-hanging fruit, and, um, you know, uh, we say once bitten, you know, twice um, shy, there's the story of, of the fox who gets his paw burnt by a forest fire ember. And so a lot of the fables about like, you know, hard work, the grasshopper um, and the ant, the scorpion and the tiger, while well, you know, a tiger can't change his stripes, a, corp a scorpion can't change its nature. The Africans had identical fables and folk tales that were eerily reminiscent just with different animals. Another similar story they had in South Africa that India and um, the Middle East and Africa fight over is the tale of Jungle Book and Mowgli, the boy who was raised, you know, by, you know, the bear and the panther or, or the tiger or the lion. The identical story. So is it cultural diffusion between Indian Ocean trade or does everybody come up with the same idea? We don't. Um, exactly no. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is a whirlwind tour of um, Africa. So here's a little bit of the Dutch settling, the Khoi Khoi Rebellion, and the eventual <coughs> British um, Cape Colony. And that, guys, is Africa. So, uh, uh, so, next week I promise not to have uh, tuberculosis or um, <laughs> Ebola. We may go a little longer next week, because after we do Mesoamerica, we're going to roll into the Renaissance and Age of Exploration, and I will add in some of the high Middle Ages that we missed um, a week ago. So we're going to build everything back in. What am I, or is that not next week? The Tang of Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty? Okay, never mind. All right, I can do that too. I thought that was next week, so we'll get it. We'll get it um, all in there. So anybody have any questions?